Half a day, students. I am Governor Lou Leon Guerrero. Welcome to PBS University. Our friends at PBS Guam and the Guam Department of Education put this episode together with some fun and exciting learning material to help you keep up with your studies. So thank you for joining us on another learning adventure. Sidzu Usmasi and have a great lesson. Half a day, and welcome to this series about archaeology and ancient sites of the Mariana Islands. These episodes introduce the most current facts and findings from archaeological sites toward clarifying what we know versus what we do not know about how people lived in the islands throughout the last thousands of years. This knowledge can support diverse new discussions, perspectives, and interpretations. I hope that you like this series, and I look forward to learning more together. In Pacific Oceania, archaeology has shown how people in ancient times explored and inhabited a vast sea of islands. Whenever people discovered and inhabited a new island area, then they found new opportunities not only for living there, but also for traveling and communicating across the sea throughout their known world. At first, people interacted across the areas of Southeast Asia and extending into the westernmost margin of the Pacific Islands. Later, through time, as people inhabited more areas, then the potential for overseas contact grew more likely and more diverse. Today, our conventional maps show different cultural areas of Southeast Asia, Micronesia, Melanesia, and Polynesia. In the past, though, at least some people traveled across those boundaries and influenced each other in various ways. For learning more about these issues, I asked archaeologist Glenn Summerhays if he please could share about his research looking into the possibilities of ancient overseas contacts between the regions that now are known as Micronesia and Melanesia. I'd like to talk briefly about interaction between New Guinea and Micronesia. We look on a map, we all go to school, we all go to primary school, we have a map of the Pacific and there's Southeast Asia over here, there's Micronesia up here, there's Melanesia here, and then we tend to put them in pigeonholes and we only look within certain regions. But the more I've been working in New Guinea, and it's been over 40 years, the more I see connections with other areas within other regions prehistoric connections, connections going back into the recent history and deep history. There's archaeologists we don't often focus on. I'll give you an example. I was working on the island of Emerau, part of the St. Matthias group. It's in northern New Ireland. It's quite a distance away from New Ireland. It's all open ocean. You're just south of the equator. When we're working there, we were looking for Lapita sites, the first footsteps of humanity into remote Oceania, uh, the first Austronesian-speaking peoples to come into this region. And we were very successful, by the way. We found uh, quite a few Lapita sites and we, we had published them. But what's got my uh, amazement wasn't so much the Lapita sites and reconstructing the land formed of 3,000 years ago. We found by accident, we weren't found, we were shown by the local chief, a series of stone monuments, stone platforms. These are quite large. Some of the stone platforms were composed mostly of stone. Others just had a stone wall with sand within it. And then one of the villages there, all the houses were on platforms raised above the normal ground. This intrigued us because this is typically not found in New Guinea. There are similar types in the Solomons with canoe houses, and a lot of people say, yeah, but Glenn, we've got these somewhere else, but they're not the same. These were found parallel to the beach. Some were small, some were large. No history of it from the local people. 
Now, I'm going to give you a bit of a, a hint of where my research went. The next stop to the north is Micronesia. You're going to catch a bus over the ocean. The next stop is Micronesia. We have nothing to the south on mainland New Guinea or in the island chain going out. So I found a book called Stone Structures of Micronesia, and the only structures similar we could locate were from the islands of Yap. The only ones that are similar. Is there a connection between Micronesia and Emerald? Well, here we have some interesting leads. The ethnographer, the German ethnographer, Richard Parkinson, who was in New Guinea, then part of the German protectorate, Deutsche Neu Guinea, he wrote a book in 1907 called Dreising Ja Unter Sudsee, 30 Years in the South Seas. And he travelled a lot. Basically, he was an ethnographer, but he was also a plantation owner. His wife was Phoebe Parkinson, the sister of Queen Emma of Samoan and American heritage. You can write a, a novel and a, put a movie about those people. In fact, I think they have. So Richard Parkinson, when he went to the St. Matthias group on the big island of Musau, now Musau is 20 kilometres away from uh, Emerald, same language group. When he got there to the north of Musau, he asked them where was their origins. In Tok Pizen, it was Ask Place Blong Yu Blong Wei. Where are your origins from? And they said to the north. The German Sud Sea expedition that came, the Hamburg Sud Sea expedition, went to the St. Matthias group because they saw remnants of Micronesian and Polynesian interaction into this region. This is the reason they went there. And indeed, in their comprehensive publication in German, they recorded all forms of material culture. Here you've got the backstrap loom, only found on the offshore islands of the Solomons, Polynesian outliers, and where else? Micronesia. And some of the tool forms are also Micronesian. So we were lucky here at Otago. When I was in Emerald, I took a copy of the German original volume with me to the island. Now, I'm going to tell you, these German originals are very rare. And if you find one, you're paying a lot of money, 1,000 US. No one can afford that. So what we did, and it's in German, so I photocopied it and bound it and gave a copy to the local school and an old man called uh, Napoli, one of the old chiefs came up. This island, by the way, has been seven-day adventures since 1928. The old man came up to me. He's looking at the book. It's in German. He couldn't read German. I don't read German. I know enough German just to ask for a, a glass of beer. And he looked at it and he started to cry. He said, there are faces here that I must know. There are stories here that's part of my history and my connections elsewhere. But I can't read them. I'm blind. Okay. Took the book back to Canberra. The late John Dennison, who was an anatomist, also was a polymath, which meant that he was skilled in many different things, and he spoke fluent Russian, French, and German. So John Dennison, from the kindness of his heart, translated the volume. I then edited the volume. I then published it for free online on our website, and I brought up some copies so people could buy copies, we put it up on Amazon for about, I don't know, $20 or $15 just to cover the cost of production. We don't make money. We cannot make money selling these things. We took copies back in colour. And the old Napoli came up to me reading the book and he started crying again. He said, Glenn, it's an old biblical song. He said, Glenn, I was blind, but now I can see. They were his relatives. That was his grandfather. That was his uncle. And they were reading the history, the connections between them and other places. And there is Micronesian connections in the deep past, but no one knows about it. And they weren't really recorded at the time that the Germans were there. So here we are, we're finding these old stone platforms that we'd love to do more work on. We actually drew them. 
We had them professionally surveyed. One of the skills archaeologists do have, patients may not be one of them, but the ability to survey in old-fashioned survey uh, equipment, not electrical surveys, old-fashioned survey equipments, and we're able to actually get a beautiful uh, map of about the 12 of these that we're able to uh, find and the way they were constructed. We did try and go back in subsequent years to excavate one to get an idea of when it was constructed by looking at shell at the base in the interior. But unfortunately, there was a drought and we just couldn't get back to the island and water was scarce and we didn't want to waste any water for the local community. And we haven't been back since, but the connections are there. And what's interesting about this is that a couple of years later, I was in Manus, the Admiralty Islands, another island group to the north of New Guinea, much larger in size. And I was looking at interaction and entry points into the northern Bismarck archipelago. That's the German name for Manus, New Britain, New Ireland, where Lapita, the early 3,000-year-old Micronesian ancestors, would have passed through. And I thought, well, where can we find... It's a bit like finding your pulse. You put your thumb on your vein and you can feel your pulse. Where can we find the pulse of this early advancement of Austronesian people? We know they came down through the southeast coast of New Guinea. We know some of them come from Southeast Asia. But through the recent research of uh, Dr. Carson and Xiaoshan Hung and Peter Bellard, myself, we were arguing that they may have come from Micronesia as well. And we still believe that for many reasons, which I won't go into detail here, but I will point out this. To look at that pulse of interaction, about nine years ago, I tried to go to the Western Islands. Now, I want to tell you, 3,000 years ago, the sea was about, I don't know, 1.6, 2 metres higher than what it is today. So all those little low-lying coral atolls and islands that you see today in southern Micronesia did not exist. They were covered with water. In fact, the only major islands that we could see were what we call the Western Islands, Ma'on Islands in the western areas of the hermit group, New Guinea. These are interesting because ethnographically, they're Micronesian. This was recorded by the Germans, but they're so remote. And the people are Micronesians. They've got Micronesian canoes, and they are a high island, which meant with higher sea level. Okay, I was in Manos a few years back, just as an exploratory trip with Professor Lisa Matusu-Smith. We spoke to um, the Catholic priest there who was from Manos, Father Paul, uh, he subsequently died at a very early age, unfortunately. Paul introduced us to a gentleman from the island of Maron who told us that from the side of the hill, there is pottery eroding out from some metres above the sea level and many metres below the top of the hill. And this intrigued us a lot. It could be pottery made on Manos today. Pottery does move around, but no one's looked at this region before. And it could very well be ancient pottery. So I applied for and received uh, a little bit of uh, research funding to go to these island groups. I was going to take with me a student that we had at the University of Papua New Guinea and also Otago. I went with the late uh, Herman Mandui, who was the deputy director of the museum. And we were in Manos. We were lucky. We, the governor, we had done a deal with the governor a year before that we had like eight 44-gallon drums of petrol, who his family just happened to manage, and we had to keep it under lock and key because there was a petrol shortage by the time we got there. Petrol prices had skyrocketed. But we were going to the island. The only thing we didn't anticipate was we picked a time of the year when it was the calmest, smoothest time of the year. You know, you can basically get on a surfboard and go for it. Well, you wouldn't believe it. Unseasonal weather climate change. You know all about it in Micronesia. I know all about it here in New Zealand and working in New Guinea. Climate change. We're getting rain when we shouldn't get rain. We're getting winds when we shouldn't get winds. Well, at three in the morning, we went down to Lorengau Harbour. This is an enclosed harbour with no outside waves coming over. And yet the water in the harbour had white tips. The coconut trees were going to and through, to and through, massive winds. The governor's personal boat driver, and these are only little banana boats with an outboard motor, he said, no, if we, once we leave the wake of Manus, he said the seas will be monstrous. And as it turned out, that was the case for the next four or five days. And the weather reports were if we had left on that boat and if we had attempted to go to Maron Island in the western islands of New Guinea, we would not have got there. In fact, we'd be 
swimming with the uh, fishes. We would have killed ourselves. So instead, instead, I went to the island of Rambucho and the Horno Islands. Very interesting island group. Had a great time there. Spoke to a lot of the local people. I had with me Dr. Bernard Minol, who unfortunately just passed away. He was uh, He's from Manos, has a doctorate in English literature. Brilliant academic. And we got talking to the local people and we recorded oral histories. One of the men that was there is a, um, a barrister for very senior politicians. And I talked to him and I said, do you have any connections between this area of Manos and Micronesia? And he said, well, we don't really. He said, but, and this is typical in Melanesia, it must be Micronesia. Well, I don't know. And then, but, and the but comes, and of course, they've got plenty of stories to tell. There's an old story in, in Manus about the coconut that floated to the north, to the island of Jap. They pronounced their Y's with a J. And then months later came back. And the people living in this region were a lighter skin colour. It had to have been Micronesia. And we know archaeologically that Manus has connections with Micronesia because in the early exploration of Micronesia in the late 19th century in Nan Madal in Ponape, one of the truly amazing sites I've seen, they found obsidian, black volcanic glass, only found in a handful of areas, not found in Micronesia, naturally, comes from a volcanic eruption, but the volcano has to have a special geology, what we call rhyolite, which is pure silica. And not many places have it. In Papua New Guinea, we have it in a few areas around the Bismarck Archipelago and Manus, also to the Ferguson Islands. Now, what's unique about this is that it looks like a black glass, like a Coca-Cola glass bottle, except it comes naturally. Men and women used to flake the glass and it would be like a razor, sharp, used in Boise's initiation ceremonies, cutting vegetables, relieving headaches by scarification of the skull and so on. Very rare outside the area is found. Very common within the area that is found, but rare when it's traded out. Now, the beautiful thing about this obsidian is that although all these obsidians look black, which they are, some are greenish, each one has a different chemical signature. Now, just like you have different fingerprints, the obsidian sources have different chemical signatures, and we have the machines to chemically analyze them. We can determine where the source is. In excavations of Nan Madol in the 1970s, uh, Professor Bill Ayers, he excavated obsidian and found it from Ponape, and it had to have come from Manos, the form of it. And recently, Peter Shepard from Auckland analyzed it, and it definitely does come from Manu. So we know that obsidian is going from the Admiralties all the way across the Ponape. We know that in the initial Lapita push in the Pacific, they're getting from Vanuatu, not only to New Caledonia and Fiji and Samoa, but later in time, they're going north to where? Cosray, Ponape. We've got, a, we've got pottery there, 2,200 years old. Some of the pottery is actually under Nam Madol. So we're getting this movement of people up to the north. To the Western Islands, we're not too sure about, but we know that there has been interaction from the last 1,000 years. And these houses that we're finding on Emerald, with the evidence that we have from the oral histories, informs us that there are deep connections between Emerald and St. Matthias Group and islands to the north, such as Yap. The sea is not a barrier for these people. It's a, a bridge. And we know this from the cultural groups, from the St. Matthias group. And the St. Matthias group over time also interacted with New Hanover and other islands to the south. So you can see it as part of a continuum of trade and exchange. And what our job is as archaeologists is trying to identify the nature of that interaction, the timing of the interactions. It would have been a different interaction 3,000 years ago than what's occurring 1,000 years ago. So disentangling these interactions of the past but interactions, they definitely were. So when you see a map of peopling of the Pacific and you have an arrow goes in this direction and you think, well, hang about, they didn't have a road book in those days. The arrows went in plenty of directions. People travelled. They knew where land was. They're not stupid. Look at the old mariners today. They can know where land is days away from land. And they traded and they interacted and they got marriage partners. But the archaeology is still patchy. Why? There's only a handful of archaeologists working in this region. So that's why we're trying to, over the last 40 years, lecture in the University of Papua New Guinea and get Papua New Guinea archaeologists to come on board and help us with these projects. 
That's part of the actual journey we've been making. Uh, we have a, two PNG students coming down to Otago next year. Uh, we're going to work around the Medang area. And Medang has another interesting area too. Medang has Carver. So there's Manos, just like the Cosray Carver and the Carver found in Ponape. It's basically a narcotic custom drink. You drink it in the afternoon. When you do, you lose all hunger any bodily needs that you forget about and you go to sleep. It's quite a passive drink, but again, it is a cultural custom drink. You just have to say the carver is found in Cosra and Ponape, and it would have come from Vanuatu. So that's another indicator of connections between Melanesia and Central Carolina Islands. Now, how can you become more involved in archaeological research? If you're a young person and you've got fire in your belly and you have access to a school, then learn as much as you can about the history of your region and the archaeology of your region. There are good history books on many of the Micronesian islands that have come out in the last 20 years. Try and learn as much as you can. To study archaeology in Micronesia, there is Guam. Guam has a very good archaeology department, and that's one avenue. The other avenue, of course, is to take a general interest in whatever uh, career you may follow, whether you're in the local community or a local farmer or even married with children, take an interest in when you go to the garden and you plant something. Take an interest in the pots and the stones that are there. These are left there by your ancestors. Note them. Show your children. Show the local school, the teachers there, that you found this. Within most Micronesian areas, you do have a historic preservation office. You can actually send an email, send a letter. Send the photographs if you've got one of these new phones that take photographs. Try and interact with those people who can and let them know that you've got this here. This is what you found. It may be extremely important. I found one of the largest lapidocytes in the Western Pacific because an old man heard me talk. And two years later, when I returned, he gave me a bag full of pottery. I said, where'd you get this from? And he showed me. It's from community interaction that archaeology proceeds and advances. People say to me, how do you find pottery on these islands? You have a machine. I don't have a machine. I talk to people. I have community interaction. And people do have an interest. And people have an interest in their past. And they have an interest in holding onto something that their ancestors made. So read, look, record, take an interest in your local school. Every island has a school. And talk to your children and your community about what you've found as something from the past. So I'm going to tell you something, and please listen. In New Guinea, we say, we talk to a past time, you had them good. When all this stuff is gone, you're not going to get it back. Record it now for future generations so that in 400 years or 300 years, they can say, I'm really happy that my ancestors set up a little museum in the community or they recorded this or one went on to school and became a history teacher or indeed one became an archaeologist. I'd rather hear that than someone say, why did my ancestors let all this go? Kapiti from New Ireland knew little about the past, but through the book that was written by the German expedition, as he cried, he said, I was blind, now I can see. You don't want future generations to be blind of your own past. Thank you for joining us in learning about archaeology and ancient sites of the Mariana Islands. If you would like to access more details, then I encourage you to visit in person or online at the Micronesian Area Research Center of the University of Guam, or at the many other libraries, museums, and offices that work with historic preservation, archaeology, and ancient history. Thank you again for watching this program. I hope that you will continue to explore and discover more. I'm Josh Tenorio, your Lieutenant Governor. Thank you for being with us today and for taking the time to continue your learning with PBS University. 
I also want to thank your teachers and support staff at DOE and PBS Guam for their work and their commitment to you, our students. Siduz Maasi, and we hope that you enjoy this PBS University instruction.